Hello, everybody. Welcome back to Dream Drop Long Distance, a podcast about two best friends bonding over the overly rushed retellings of surprisingly poorly aged Disney films that make up the Kingdom Hearts series. I'm Kyle Bradshaw, joined as always by my dear friend and yours, Mitchell Orsino. (laughs) How have you been? Hey, man. Uh, That was a very, very kind way of saying that they have They speed run through some of these major Disney properties. We'll get into it in a little bit. For sure. I was shocked at uh, how how poorly this uh, this particular franchise translated over to Kingdom Hearts. Yeah, man. Uh, To everybody listening. Welcome back. And uh, we'll be starting talking, as I think we had mentioned in the last one. um, So the new world that we're going to is I don't remember if it had a name but it's it's the Pirates of the Caribbean level. Port Royal. Oh, is that what it, do they actually Royal, call one of those? Yeah, but I said, do they yeah. do they call the world Port Royal? I couldn't remember. They do. Yeah. Interesting, because. Yeah, because the Port Royal is just the name of the port. It doesn't it's not associated with any of the uh, anything else in that franchise. <laughs> yeah, I'm not really sure where they landed on that, but. It works. I mean, at least it didn't just immediately say Pirates of the Caribbean. Yuck, yuck. Yeah, no, nah, I agree. They could have they could have gotten a little or they could have made up a name, which ugh, that might have been rough. Right. I mean, I would have really rather it have been like Tortuga. That would have been cool because like ah, as I recall from the films, Tortuga was a really cool place. Port Royal is not. Yeah. Yeah. Well, actually, that's a that's a really good one. I, I, we're, I don't want to. I don't want to get too sidetracked on us coming up with names for like they're not paying us for this. They're not paying us to come up with names for their worlds. And it's okay. Who knows what lies in in front of us in future Kingdom Hearts games? We may wink, wink, end up coming back to the uh, the pirates realm. True, true. You that is correct. Uh, I don't know, but it might happen. So, I, I, what I find interesting is that we the step into this world and immediately the first thing is that Sora, Donald, and Goofy all notice that this place is, quote, kind of different. And there's a reason for that, which didn't really hit me until this uh, most recent playthrough, which is that out of all of the Disney worlds that we've been to, they've all been animated features. Mm-hmm. So they've all had their own style and flow to them, like, uh, you know, Alice in Wonderland, Tarzan, stuff like that. They, they've all had a, a vibe. Here, we're talking about a live action film. Yeah. Pirates of the Caribbean. God, what? I don't even remember what year that came out in, but this is the first time that they've put Sora, Donald, and Goofy into a live action world. Which is even more, I don't know what the word for it is, I guess realistic or or something. Like, I, I don't know what it must look like to them. Because normal to them, uh, like to Donald and Goofy, normal is the type of people that you see in Disney Castle. Where normal to Sora is people like the Destiny Islands and what you see on Hollow Bastion. You know, anime stylized humans where these guys are gritty in a way that is just like foreign to to the the trio. Yeah, no, they're they're not stemmed from uh, what we would consider reality, I guess. What do you think about it? It's like, I don't know if like pseudo meta makes sense. Uh, I might just be making that up, but. The idea that it's like, oh, it stems from reality, but it's a fake reality. <laughs> but for cartoon characters, I don't know. It, it's weird. Uh, I also really quick looked, and that film came out in 2003. Oh, my gosh. So basically a year after the first game came out. Yeah. So it basically like the, it came out a year after the first game, and they were like, this is a slam dunk. We're putting it in the second one. It makes me wonder who pushed for that. Like, did the Japan team at Square Enix push for this? Did the American team at Disney push for this? I'm so curious whose side wanted Pirates in. I don't know. I don't know. But I did see, just off a brief glance, that it is the 15th highest grossing film series of all time. So they probably just saw the dollar signs and were like, how do we keep pushing Pirates 
as many ways as we can. You know, that actually, you make a good point because I was watching this incredible YouTube video uh, about finding the composer of the Disney Channel theme. Great video. I'll link it in the description. Um, but at one point, they talk about what it's like to be in the pitch room for uh, for Disney. Like, OK, we have this new thing coming up. How are we going to promote it? And they're like, OK, we've got so many different uh so much, we have these merchandise things that we need to push we have okay we need to put some of these ads on disney channel we need to you know whatever it, hmm. i could see this like okay pirates is doing really well let's keep pushing it by putting it in kingdom hearts or kingdom hearts is cool but what if we try to drive more people to it by putting pirates in it i don't know i could see a symbiotic relationship there even though they're really not a good fit for one another you know not yeah i mean that's that's an interesting thought of like where like what came first the disney or the or the the kingdom hearts or the pirates but yeah i don't know but i i do agree and i guess we and we'll jump into it a little bit as yeah the guys are kind of in the game or thinking this looks really weird but it's also kind of funny you say that because i thought it was also interesting that they went for like slightly more realistic human figures versus the kind of more like anime Japanese art style that we get from Sora and Leon and the Final Fantasy characters, uh, especially in the the very next scene where the guys run into Pete, who is warning the uh, the evil Captain Barbosa and his undead crew about Sora and basically be like, you guys need to watch out because these guys have like magic and stuff. Can I just say it is so unbelievably funny to me to see Pete and Barbosa talk to one another. It's so weird. Like, and just, it's, I mean, because Barbosa's talking to him with like his pirate accent, and Pete's just like, still like, oh, yeah, we gotta watch out. For, and it, like, their, their art styles completely contrast one another. It, it kind of reminds me of uh, any scene that Hercule was in with Goku, you know, in a weird way. I don't know why. It's just like, it, there's nothing that ties these two together. I love it. It honestly, it, it, it very, it, um, this level fear feels very who framed Roger Rabbit, where you've got these very humanoid people that are now being influenced and have their world influenced by like these cartoon characters. That is a hundred percent like the entire plot line of Kingdom Hearts. So yeah, yeah. but like more so here than anywhere else. Yeah. This one just felt more heavy handed they come to they try to fight you you go to fight them they're technically undead and the whole gimmick of this level is that you can't fight you can't hurt them unless they are um in these one these you know these patches of the battlefield that are under moonlight and then you see their like spectral forms and you can hit them with your keyblade on top of that uh that was one aspect that pete mentioned in his uh monologue to barbosa warning how to stay safe from us the other thing is that he really harped on magic the use of magic so i don't mm -hmm. know if you noticed this because i know you're more of a bruiser type like you were saying or white mage what have you but magic does incredible damage to these pirates i, I mean i don't know if you noticed this but like i, I was doing maybe one or two lightning strikes and taking out these pirates and also like i don't know if it changed based on what spell you use because i wasn't digging too far into it but uh like if i l hit a pirate with lightning or thunder or whatever uh they would like start walking in a in a jilted kind of way so they, they were like unable to even con participate in the fight it was kind of uh it was extremely useful so thanks pete for the tip oh that's cool if it, if most, I think lately all I'll use is um is fire because I like that it does like the spinny kind of AOE to kind of try to clear out some some people from you and cure. I haven't really dabbled in a whole lot of magic other than other than that, so I guess I didn't really notice. Now you say like the lightning affected them a bit more. Did you try using like Blizzard to see if maybe it stunned them for longer? Like did you do any kind of creepy pirate tests? No. Okay. No, it's the only thing I didn't do. I should go back, though. Maybe we'll have a reason to go back to that world, but uh, I, I should go back. But I, I don't know. So so we press forward a little bit, though. Uh, Ooh, real quick, before we press forward. Dude, how how dope was it fighting in battles to the Pirates of the Caribbean soundtrack? 
it was great for about five minutes, but then you start to realize <laughs> that you get into the fight and the music starts, and then you get out of the fight and the music transitions back, and then you get into another fight and the music yeah. starts again from the beginning, and I'm like, oh my god, please let me be free of this song. <laughs> yeah. It's so they, intense. I love it, but like, ah, uh, make it stop. Yeah, they're kind of unrelenting with it. It, it, it it's a lot of fun at first and then it harkens kind of back to if anybody or if any, for those who have been following us since our kingdom hearts one playthrough, I, it's a very, it's a very under the sea moment of dear God, if this plays one more time. Speaking of under the sea, we'll have some, uh, some uh-huh. at the end of the episode, but we'll get there. Um, <laughs> but yes, it was very fun to, to, for about five minutes, it was very fun to have that song, but then you start to notice like, wow, this song is still playing. So I'm, 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 I'm thankful that this world was a short one. Yeah. And there's not much variation to it or the world because, you know, it, and I don't think we have to go too, too crazy into this. It basically, if you really want to know what this level's about, even for the most part, just go watch the movie. I mean, it, you, you're kind your characters are kind of just sidelined watching how s- certain parts of the movie played out. You know, you meet Will, you meet Elizabeth, you find out about all the undead magic gold stuff. Uh, you meet Jack, you go try to beat the bad pirates and save Elizabeth. And if anything, I will say that uh, this is a terrible Johnny Depp voice double. Like, oh, I, I, yeah, I, it is. I, all, my sincerest apologies to the voice actor. It is not your fault. I, I oh my God, I do not like this voice, this voice double for Johnny Depp. Yeah, it was like a very you could tell they didn't want him to really push the push the like the the accent much. Um so he was kind of like, well, you see, uh, I was like he's more he more just sounded like he was raspy and needed water. <laughs> oh my gosh. Uh, yeah, cuz I mean like there's also this this certain level of drunkenness to Captain Jack that there just did not exist in this iteration of uh Jack Sparrow. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, I mean, I thought outside of the storyline, the bigger, the big beats that I thought were or the things that I thought were really cool about this were the on deck uh, battles between either pirates or heartless on the Black Pearl between Port Royal and uh, Isla de Muerta, the like island where Barbosa is trying to put all the gold back. Yeah, the uh, the fights on the on the ship were kind of cool. I wish they were a little longer because they it felt like I don't know. It was like one wave of Heartless and then it was just over. Or if you wanted to just completely avoid the wave of Heartless, you could go into the ship and then come back out and it was over or something. I didn't really get that part. But um, yeah, the 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 combats were short, especially if you were a heavy magic user like me. It's like okay, I cast Thunder three times and now they're all dead and it's time to moves on to the destination i guess oh i didn't even think about how that probably would be much quicker for you the only real time i had any trouble with them was because obviously there were like pockets of moonlight and i would get into a combo and one of them would fall out of it and i would be like oh my god why are you invincible like this you had barely a quarter of a bar of health that was kind of frustrating at times that's true that's true that would that would backfire on me sometimes too uh, like I'd be using thunder and, uh, it would like kind of get them stunned and jilted. And then they'd start moving stunned and jilted for a couple seconds into the moonlight. And it's like, well, crap. And now I just have to wait for them to be unstunned and just sit here for a couple seconds. Okay. Please come out now. I know it's, and you can't go into the shaded area and try to hit them out of it because every year, well, your blows just don't do anything. Yeah, exactly. So I I don't know. It was fine. It was okay. I I will say I made a mistake. And so the, you know, the 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 island that you get to we we find another one of these absent silhouettes. I don't know if you caught that. Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I didn't touch this one either because I <laughs> like I am sure they can be done at our level, but I, I'm not touching that right now. I I don't know if it can be done at our level because I did it for fun because I noticed what the the logo was. 
And I was like, oh, I'm pretty sure I know what organization member this is. And I was right. And I, I, I won't spoil it unless you want to talk about it briefly. But I jumped in and it was very akin to the first time I fought Sephiroth, where it was a one hit. I was gone. Oh, no. <laughs> yeah, it oh, no, was I'm scared. OK, it was. Oh, dude, it was bad. I was like, there's no way I'm going to have to come back with like much later to try to compete. Yeah, I, I don't know what I don't know what to make of all that. I mean, I'm excited for the fights, but it's going to be a little bit. It, it's weird that they're kind of sprinkling them out now. Mm -hmm. And we just have to, like, remember that they're there and go back later on. I don't know. Well, yeah, it'll, uh, I'm sure it'll all be a lot of fun when we do get to the end game, though. And it's like, all right, let's do all the hard stuff now. <laughs> I know. I was thinking about that, too, because uh, so far I think we've ran into what we ran into the one in Hades and we've ran into the one here. I believe. Yeah, those are the only two for now. OK, that was the only two. I was like, I thought that was the only two. Uh, but yes. So uh, I highly recommend we we go ahead and we put a pin in those and we come back to them later. Absolutely. Yeah, because I have. Yeah, we'll, we will get there. We will get there when we get there. So. Mm -hmm. uh the fast forwarded plot of Pirates of the Caribbean continues. I really have no idea what's happening here. I mean, I have every idea because I've watched the movie, but if I was just going in blind, I'd be so confused as to why anything is happening. Yeah, and dude. I don't know if like Pirates of the Caribbean was just a confusing movie or if it's only confusing because we're missing basically an hour's worth of context that is no longer oh. given to us. Oh, no, no, no. I mean, the movie, it, the movie was a little convoluted, but at least it made sense and it kept you like you knew why things were happening and why people were going to places. Yeah, I know this. This They just took the the entire story. And like you said, they cut about an hour's worth of content out. And they just expected that to me, they just expected that people who played this level would have seen Pirates of the Caribbean. And which is a fair assumption when this game came out. Yeah, because I. I don't think I knew a person alive who hadn't seen that movie when it came out. Yeah, I remember being so excited when that was coming out. I remember seeing like promotional stuff around like this is a weird memory. But like uh, I was at like a baseball game at Zephyr Stadium. There were Sick. people handing out uh, merch from Pirates of the Caribbean. Just like, hey, that's hey, cool. see the thing. And I'm just like, oh, cool. Get to uh, reference to anybody, uh, Zephyr Stadium back in southern Louisiana was an old uh, minor league baseball team stadium. Now known as the Baby Cakes. The Baby Cakes. <laughs> <laughs> uh, one of the creepiest mascots you will ever see. Uh, we're not Don't linking look. the picture in the show notes. You can go look for it yourself. So anyway. Um, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I think I think we go to the island and then we leave the island, come back to the island. And at this point, Jack is like now a required party member. And uh, it says like Jack must remain in the party and summons cannot be used. I think that was a weird stipulation that I hadn't seen before any previous time that we've had a, a required party member. Yeah, I didn't understand why they wouldn't let us use summons. Because up to this point, all we have is Chicken Little. Um, which I've started figuring out how to use him. He is incredible for farming and for um for level grinding. Right. Because I, I know if you don't go into his FPS mode, you can keep him out almost almost forever because he just like as you are doing damage to enemies, his bar is recharging, which makes it easier to level him up or sorry, level up summons in general which means that his bar is even longer to begin with. So you can have Chicken Little out for an extremely long time. I forget what exactly he does in combat, though, if you don't go into FPS mode. So the I tried the FPS mode, did not enjoy it. Um, I thought the controls were kind of wonky. But Chicken Little's base ability is that he... It's I think it's, so it's two, two different things. At first he yells, hold it, and it kind of like stagnates the Heartless... And then he blows this little whistle, which then it like almost like a mega magnet just sucks all the enemies right into you, which allows you to basically to like multi to combo multiple enemies at a time. So he is very good for like if there's a bunch of enemies kind of around you, but out of reach a little bit, he will constantly just kind of suck them towards you 
right in your face where you just start you can just start wailing on him he i i I really i don't remember playing with him back when i first played this game but he is super useful yeah i'll have to try him out a little bit more often i just remember using him a bit in uh in timeless river just to like again to pull him all closer and i was like wow this is lasting forever i like this yeah especially especially whenever your drivers um yeah whenever you have like a higher level of drive it it he lasts for quite a while no joke so uh yeah we we get jack forcibly put into our party we have to like <laughs> i think we have to save ourselves from the ship because we've been captured by barbosa and barbosa's mm-hmm. gonna blow up our ship with the help of pete or something like that and there's these big explosive barrels that are all over the place and we're able to get out because jack just has a knife cuts us out yeah <laughs> And we have to, there's this part where we have to throw these powder kegs off of the ship while also dealing with Heartless that are fighting us. I think there might be an infinite amount. I'm not sure. I didn't check that. But if you aren't quick on the barrels, the Heartless will light the barrels. And if you, if one of those blows up, you're probably in trouble. I don't know. I thought this was going to be hard and it just wasn't. I just ran around and threw the barrels overboard and it was over in like 30 seconds if that yeah i I don't remember if it was infinite i just the moment all the barrels left i think it ended it wasn't a very memorable fight for me yeah it it was just weird and but kind of like a little bit charming just a little bit like they did something different and i feel like that is the theme of kingdom hearts 2 of just like it's not always just combat it's combat with a little extra yeah yeah i agree but but then you basically just go right back to that island and, you know, we fight our way through and we get back and we see basically the exact same scene as we had previously. Uh, Barbosa trying to break the curse. And Donald, actually, there was a really funny line here where my they favorite, all my favorite part I, of this whole world. I had a feeling you would love this is that they run in. And Barbosa looks at them and he's like, that's not possible. And which Donald looks at him and goes, not probable. And I'm like, Donald, <laughs> shut up. <laughs> it's just so much funnier being delivered in his voice, too. Like, it's already a good line, but read as Donald. Oh, my God. It's hilarious. Like, 10 out of 10. Thank you, Disney, for that. I was like, that's incredible. He's like, not probable. We're alive and we're pirates it's just like whatever but then we yeah then we jump into a boss battle that was it was okay yeah except we had to like before we could actually get into the boss battle they had to kill jack but jack lives because he stole a coin Mm -hmm. it's like okay so we're fighting with zombie jack now i don't remember if zombie jack does anything different but he's zombie jack now and they just wanted that to be cool i guess which is kind of yeah, I think that's the real theme of this world is like, you know what would be cool? And then you just kind of did it a little bit. Yeah, it was weird because I noticed he wasn't taking damage when he wasn't in basically kind of same thing as Barbosa, where he had to be in a pool of moonlight to take damage. The one thing that did bug me that I didn't realize because I was I was very close to beating him. And all of a sudden it said I had game. Uh, the game ended and I was like, I was like, whoa, what happened? It said, like, Jack died. And I was like, wait, if... Oh. The, I was like, I was like, oh, wait, it didn't tell me if Jack died. That... So, because I noticed that the Barbosa character was really, really adamant about attacking Jack while I was attacking it. And I was like, oh, so it doesn't have to beat me. It just has to beat the other AI. I was like, that's kind of... Okay. That is some bull, and I have never noticed that. Like, wow. I, I, I mean, again, they're doing things a little differently. I, yeah, no, I didn't run into that problem. I didn't have any kind of problem with this fight. So, uh, though I will say there's, there is one other big quirk about this fight, and that's that Pete comes in and brings this strange lizard heartless that adds darkness to the fight. Yeah, it's like a weird kind of like lantern gecko thing. And it doesn't really it doesn't like yeah. attack you or anything. You just have to kind of really quickly move around the battlefield and you see like this glowing pair of eyes and you just attack it and it'll disappear and the fog clears up. It was it was a little gimmicky. 
I think it was fun. I enjoyed this. Be- I mean, could it have been more interesting? Sure. But I yeah. think it was fine as is. Like, just, oh, okay, we gotta, we can't just keep fighting the one guy. Okay, hang on. I can't see a darn thing. And there's certainly no moonlight now. So let me go get the bad uh, darkness lizard and <laughs> yeah. move on with uh, move on with the fight. Yeah. And like Barbosa was OK. I mean, to me, the coolest part of this was the uh, the Jack, because I don't I guess you don't do a whole lot of the drive combos. Um, I I really enjoyed the Sora Jack drive combo where it you'll get a prompt to press triangle and it says land where Barbosa goes to attack and Sora steps on his blade and then they kind of all look at each other, like stare each other down and then. Right after that, it's a move called Reverse Blade, where Jack kind of flips you up, swings his sword, hits Barbosa, and then Sora does like this wheelie roundhouse or this like backwards heel kick to Barbosa's chin. And I was like, oh, that's smooth. Like, that's really cool. Oh, man, I had a completely different one. I There was something called Twin Counter, where uh, it. I don't know. It was like a it was like a cool sword fight moment. And then he had to follow it up with Sonic Dive where Sora got launched up in the air. And there was this moment where you could like see the moonlight through the the hole in the cove. And it's like, oh, my oh. God, this is so cool. And you just like slam down on him. I was like, what? So, again, super cool stuff. Like, I need to go back and see the one you're talking about because that sounds cool, too. But definitely go check out Twin Counter plus Sonic Dive like that was something it felt it, it felt like they was they were pulling on something from the movie that i probably would have remembered if i had seen it in the last decade <laughs> okay I, yeah I need a, mine wasn't wasn't really like a big animation it was it just felt like very choreographed uh fighting which i was like oh this is cool yours sounds sick i'm kind of jealous i didn't get that one I'll, I'll try and find it on youtube it's really cool okay i will as well and we'll uh we'll try to put them in the notes but then this, we I guess so we wind up beating him. It's the whole thing. Jack's like, I have my ship back. Will and Elizabeth are in love. Obviously, one of the funniest parts of this is that Donald and Goofy then start making fun of Sora because they're like, Oh, you're you're thinking about somebody, aren't you? And he's like, Shut up. Like, no, I'm not I'm not thinking about girls. I, I'm not thinking about girls. <laughs> Poor guy, man. Like just seeing a guy and girl hug gets Sora blushing. Like uh, I mean, I understand why he's getting roasted by his friends. That's just normal behavior. Oh, but I feel absolutely. Bad for him too, a little bit. Well, it's like, is she really worth it if the boys aren't roasting you over? True story. Absolute facts right there. <laughs> um, and then, of course, it, we uh, Jack's little compass starts glowing. That's our keyhole uh, per every level. Like the most important object they keep pointing out at some point winds up being the lock to the key of the, the hole, the keyhole of the world. And we get uh, we get a new Keyblade. It was this one's OK. Uh, I don't know if you remember, but it's called Follow the Wind. Yeah, it's a weird name for it, but it's fine. It just kind of like uh, it draws in. It draws in nearby orbs. Yeah, it includes the draw ability, just like anything else. Like, oh, OK, fine. Sure. Yeah, I think it it, it was a because it's a plus. It's a plus two strength, plus one magic. Doesn't really have many other effects. And it just like it it can draw nearby things a little. I think it adds like a 20 or 30 percent. It just it, it's not worth, really worth using to me. I think they could have done. I think they could have done more with a pirate's theme blade. OK, so I actually disagree with you here because it is on brand for the world. Because I don't know if you looked at Jack's skills, but Jack had like three draw abilities equipped by default he did a lot of his stuff had to, i mean it has to do with stealing exactly yeah the the man is a is a human vacuum for gold and and health orbs which apparently is a good thing if he can die to barbosa so it sounds ah. like a good thing that he can do that but still it's 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 on brand but it and it means that the keyblade's on brand too for sure a little for sure eh, kind of uh, like I said, I don't know. I think there were other levels that I thought all the Keyblade designs in this game were a lot of fun, but it's like 75, 25 to you. Like there's just a couple of Keyblades. That I was like, man, they just missed the mark on what all they could maybe do with this. And that just felt like one of them. Yeah, I felt like I used more Keyblades in Kingdom Hearts 1, but I could just be mistaken. 
Uh, okay, that's funny. So far, I feel like I've definitely swapped more on this one than I did on the other. Well, also, that was much later game. I feel like, the, especially in Kingdom Hearts 1, I feel like the disparity between them broadened later in the game. Like, probably the last, like, 75% of the game, those Keyblades all had something unique and different that made you want to use them under different circumstances. And here I am, by comparison, I'm still using the Mulan Keyblade as my primary. It's a gummy... That, no, that's a perfect Keyblade for you. I It's going to take a while for me to drop the um, the Olympus Keyblade. I'll tell you that much. Yeah, that's true. That's true. So, uh, from here, before we get uh, into the world that we all dread atlantica <laughs> i actually took a took a little detour back to the underdrome because the pain and panic cup has opened up did you uh did you do any of this i did i did the the pain and panic cup the last time we were here the guys realized that they or actually i don't even know if they realized it because sora is talking to orin at one point and he's like, yeah, um, Zeus locked this thing up. Yeah, but somebody must have broken the seal that allowed the underdrome to get open again. And Sora, completely unknowing that he was the one to unlock the thing, was like, who would do that? What an idiot. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. He's, he's like, how did it get unlocked? And Orin's like, some fool must have broken the seal. And Sora's like, what an idiot. <laughs> it's like, <laughs> oh, that was so funny. I was like, that's incredible that he just he still doesn't know. But nobody can tell him anything because they didn't figure it out either. Yeah, because, I mean, the thing that he actually unsealed was a, a rock in the shape of Meg. So, yeah, I don't blame him for not noticing it, but it's also really funny for us. Sure, sure, sure. Yeah, I, mean, I thought it was I thought it was great. Um, but the Underdrome itself, it's interesting, I think, because this one is. Um, there's a level cap or they it gives you like a level dif level difficulty starting at like 25. It doesn't allow you to use drive forms and your items don't regenerate between rounds. So whatever items that you have, those are the only ones that you get. Yeah, you also don't gain experience. Which I hate. It's making me so mad because I love uh using things like the coliseum to go and earn experience i was i was really expecting like oh okay well you know i'll just give it a few tries and as i go through it'll get easier it did not get easier <laughs> no it yeah. stayed the same level yeah that was that was the fact that this like it's not really you can't really grind like you did in the last game which i don't i, I don't know do you know if after the pain and panic cup do other cups allow experience or is this just the underdrome is just like no I think it's probably an underdrum thing of just you don't earn experience, which stinks, uh, but like, I get it. Well, that sucks. But it, it, I thought the levels were interesting and pretty balanced. I, I thought it interesting that they allowed you to use limit abilities, but it's kind of like this that coin based thing where as you're defeating enemies, you get these gold coins. I couldn't figure out. Because there were some times where I had a load of coins and none of my limit abilities were available. But then, like, other times I didn't have a lot of them and I could use, like, Trinity. I didn't get it. It was weird. Okay, so your ability to use limits, to my knowledge, now, I haven't tried using limits inside of the, or inside of the Coliseum, but your ability to use limits, to my knowledge, is based on how much MP you have. So if you've used Cure recently your and your mp is empty then you can't use any limits interesting okay because huh i didn't remember well i guess i was using cure quite a lot okay well that's good to know i didn't realize that was magic based i assumed that was strictly for that the way they were the way they explained it was like oh yeah you need these coins to uh, to use your limit abilities so i thought maybe that was like a a different case but no, I thought the I thought the coins were just there to be your score, which is going to be something interesting. Hmm. At least it means that like not where before you and I would compete on on like time, the amount of time yeah. that you'd have to finish. Now it's like okay, how what score did you get at the end of it? And I don't really understand the scoring system I, because it's like each hit, quote unquote, is actually based on how many heartless you defeated. 
and then something happens. I don't really understand when or how or what it requires, but something happens and it'll say entered double score mode. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But I'm, I'm intrigued. Well, I think that's just like randomized because I that wasn't happening on the same level every time. Like sometimes I would have them early, like around uh, level around two and three. Sometimes I wouldn't have it till like round seven. It could be something like, oh, if you get up to a certain score, you get double score. I feel like I need to Google it now and find the answer. That's cool. We'll, we'll dig into it. Um, But did you did you complete it? Did you beat it? No, I didn't. I got to the final fight and I was out of potions because uh, I'm still not used to my macros for some reason. And sometimes uh, when I try to cast thunder, I end up pressing potion. And I was like, well, OK. I... I will say it took me a good number of times to get to the final battle. But the final battle, actually, the final uh, round actually wasn't the hardest one that I had. Oh, wow. Oh, let me guess. It was probably the the one with the two cars in it. The Okay, yes. So the two car round was... Blah. So to everybody, yeah, I mean, this the, the Underdrome kind of throws... I find decently balanced rounds of enemies at you like the they that they complement each other very well and what kind of heartless that you're fighting but yeah there is in one particular i think it's like round five there are two of those car heartless that oh they're like that's one thing i've the moment i see those on a battlefield i am immediately barreling at them and i am just melee combat air comboing the absolute crud out of i like i give them no quarter like there is no stopping until they are done because the moment i let them go they go into that invincible mode and it's so annoying yeah you just end up dead there is just nothing you can do about that because they will run you down and do like three quarters of your health with one hit or something ridiculous like that and it's like eh. Yeah. To be fair, it's because we're a little under leveled. Like I'm 23 going into this right now. I haven't bothered to actually get to 25 yet. I made sure to at least be 25 when I went in there. Um, okay, so and, I have some catching up to do. Yeah, I and that helped because when I hit like 25, 26, I knew I was like, okay, I started clearing the levels a little bit easier. They were still challenging. Yeah, but basically, I think there's ten. Le- there's ten rounds. And they're all pretty, pretty fun, challenging. And my big issue is that I don't have a lot of magic per what we've talked about previously. And Donald in this game, man, he is squishy. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, I keep him loaded down with items. I'm like, oh, what's that? Uh, A new item that can really boost defense. Okay, cool. Like I've been... I've been doing a lot of synthesis. I don't know if you've been keeping up with the synthesis stuff, but I've been like, Uh, oh, look, I can make a Faraga ring or Faraga band or something. Throw it on him. Let's go. Man, I have been giving him and I I, I, comparison to old other games. I took your advice and I have been keeping up with synthesis. I'm not I'm still not great at it, but I'm getting better. Um, And yes, I have been even with the the amount of like defensive and armor boosts that i've given him i still feel like donald is just a piece of glass man (laughs) a literal glass cannon one might say yeah like it's crazy how much he goes down in this game compared to the other ones where i'm just like dude like i i don't know sometimes i'm just like i just i gotta let it i'll I'll let him go down i'm like i'll I'll get to you in a minute but there's also like I'm, i'm you know i'm playing a bruiser type where I'm like, I need, I need you up, dude. Like, why do you keep going down? Yeah, especially since he's a healer. Like, he has yes. cure, and that is extremely helpful. Like, he, he keeps Goofy up, which I am so thankful for. Yes. Um. Also, what one, like, one thing I noticed in this game that I thought is kind of weird, or two, actually, it's two parts about healing and the mechanics and how they work, and is that if you use cure. If you're too far away from one of your teammates, it does not cure them. Yeah. Have you noticed that there's a little green circle that appears when you use cure? Yes. I noticed that later because I was trying. I remembered I was I was trying to cast cure during the, one of the underdrome fights and Goofy was near me. But Donald was across the stage and I was like, oh, I'll cast cure. heal Donald. And he didn't get up. And I was like, oh, what the heck? And I realized I was like. Wait, is there a new distance thing I'm not noting? And then, of course, 
on top of that. Then I tried to get him up with a potion. And I don't know what the mechanic is. But you know how normally when you you have like a potion connected to a hotkey, it'd be like, who do you want to give a potion to? Well, in this game, for some reason, it doesn't do that. So it just assumes you're trying to give a potion to Sora. And I didn't realize it was going to do that. So I healed Sora for no reason. And then Donald just stayed. Down. It was I was like, oh, the healing mechanics in this game are driving me crazy. Yeah, you basically just have to start from square one. It works completely differently from Kingdom Hearts one. And I think that the changes are actually good. Now it's like, OK, I can cast cure once and heal myself and Donald and Goofy or whoever just happens to be nearby. Yeah. Uh, rather than having an awkward system of like, OK, I want to cure. OK, I want to use the cure on Donald or OK, I want to cure. I want to use it on Goofy. Like they took out a menu, which just makes cure faster. Same thing for potions. Everything's faster now. Sure. And uh, because of the way that like it, it used to be, that you could just like keep casting cures as long as you just had you know, little mana chunks. And now it's okay. You use cure. All right. All your mana is gone. Good luck for a little bit. Uh huh. So they, they really rebalance the whole system and I like it. So it's, it's growing on me. I think I just need to get used to it. I don't hate it. Like, I, I mean, I'm, I'm enjoy. I'm still enjoying myself. I didn't find it was like a hindrance. Honestly, I thought it kind of added a little bit of challenge. I will say, you know, one piece of challenge that I was not expecting was after nine rounds of fighting for them to throw Yuffie and Leon at us. <laughs> yeah, I, I should have expected that because I think they were like that exact combo was a boss fight in the first uh, Coliseum. It was it was. I, I felt like they had new moves in this one. I wouldn't know Yuffie destroyed me and I didn't really get to fight them very long. <laughs> <laughs> I... I realized really quickly because like I, said, I think I've, I played this a um, couple levels higher than you did because I was able to beat him. Yeah, Yuffie was definitely public enemy number one for me where I was like, nope, you are not about to be bouncing around and pot shotting me with ninja stars. And so I just come. I can basically ignored Leon until I didn't have to. Fair enough. Um, but once she's once she's out, it's pretty easy. I'm sure I'll be checking that out soon. All right, we got one. We got a little bit more time, so let's. Uh, we can we can go check out. Or we can talk about Atlantica. Atlantica is different than it used to be. It's in, it is its own world in the world map, and you can kind of explore it a little bit. But in in practice, it's actually uh, a collection of gated mini games. Yeah. And it's honestly like the same mini game every time, I think from what I remember, but basically you show up, Ariel rescues Prince Eric sings to him, whatever. And then everybody is trying to distract Ariel from her feelings about the people on the surface and about this Prince that they don't know about because she's falling in love and nobody knows that, but everybody's like, man, Ariel's really down. So let's distract her. <laughs> <laughs> let's just pretend like these feelings don't exist. So let's put on a musical extravaganza. Yeah, they are. They are jazzed about this musical and they're like, oh, well, maybe if we get Ariel to focus on practicing for the musical, we'll stop. She'll stop having feelings. And I'm like, that did not <laughs> that did not age well. And, you know, it's it's like it's cute. It's you're literally you're ba you're basically just playing a musical performance that Sebastian is putting on that involves all three of your characters, Ariel, Flounder and a couple other little um, like aquatic creatures. It's very this is probably one of the most Disney things that they have put in these games. Absolutely. And it's so easy to but in a, in a OK way, I'm sure it's going to get harder as we go along. But right now it's just pressing a single button when it is time to press that button like yeah. i'm feeling vibes of donkey konga guitar hero just that era of video games is just being called back to right here you're just you just press the button at the right time and it's not even like different buttons it's just always the x button so i think it'll get harder down the line if i if my memory serves it gets a little harder but right now yeah it's literally one button yeah, I think I think it, later they start including multiple. I don't remember right offhand, but, you know, it's cute. And I thought that like the song is kind of cheesy, but it's also very kind of cutesy Disney. 
And yeah, like I didn't mind it. Uh, I think, but yeah, I mean, this entire level is basically you're just playing through the storyline and it, these little events that are kind of just like, like you said, like uh, animatic mini games that require you to press buttons at a certain time. So v- to me, it's very, very different from what we've had from other levels. And I'm thankful for that. Like, I would yeah. not want to have to play Atlantica as a real world ever again. So <laughs> I, I agree. I will say they did. I, they did kind of fix the swimming mechanic a little bit. Yeah, because they didn't have to have combat with it. Yes. So I was that. That's nice. You know, even a little bit of movement you have to do. It was like, OK, cool. Like they I think they figured out really quickly that people didn't necessarily want or need that level you see the feedback from our podcast was extremely helpful in <clears throat> <laughs> yeah, feedback from our podcast they they went to the they went like what what is that now like 14 years into the future and they were like yeah what are these two guys from south louisiana saying about our <laughs> atlantic level <laughs> <laughs> oh yes that's exactly what they did um uh the, one one last thing that i really liked about this level was literally just in the final chorus of the first song everybody is singing like you can kind of hear goofy but you can really hear donald singing mm-hmm. and uh as you get out of the song donald's like hey i want to sing more lines <laughs> I'm like, like Don- donald i do want you to sing more lines donald i actually do it's like i i enjoy that you enjoy this donald <laughs> <laughs> um, it was, yeah, it was, it was fun. And yeah, like it, it, it gets, it gets more, I think it's going to get a little more expansive later on, but they kind of introduce you. I think we had talked about last time where you brought up the idea of chapters or like episodes in each level. And this one very specifically, uh, at the end of the thing, Flounder is like, Hey, I actually found this, this thing outside of the city that I think Ariel might like. And so you go out there and you he brings you to this shipwreck that obviously was Eric's ship. And there's a statue of him underneath a rock. And he's like, if we bring this back to Ariel, she might be happy again. And the guys are like, OK, sure. Why not? They go to move it. And I, I was like, OK, is there something we got to do here? And then it kicks you out of the world. And it says, like, you need the magnet magic spell to move that. Come back when you have it. And I was like, oh, you actually have to hit like mile markers and get specific abilities to f- come finish and keep playing this world. Yeah, it's a little awkward. Like you're just immediately booted out to the world map, which is convenient in one sense, because it's like, well, there's literally nothing else to do here. As- assuming you picked up the one crown that's in the one map that you can access on that world. Yeah. There's not really anything to do, so it, it's convenient that they kick you out since, you know, rather than like, OK, I'm done here and let me go to the save point and go back to the world. map. Uh, yeah, yeah. No, I, I yeah, it was like it was, it was OK for the first part of this that obviously it seems like we're probably going to go back to a couple of times. Yeah. So since we have just a few extra minutes, though, I just want to talk to you about something, Mitchell. I, and I don't know if, if you've done much of this, and it's okay if you haven't. I have been spending... Huh, no, how do I put this? <laughs> I like I this game a lot, and the amount that I like this game doesn't always line up with our recording schedule. Sure. So I find ways to just, like, keep playing when it is finally time to play it's like okay i finished the world now what i want to keep playing i have invested hours of my life today just doing gummy missions (laughs) Uh, dude the gummy missions are actually a lot of fun they really truly are i'm trying to think what like what what draws you to like which ones in particular do you did you like so much it's it's all of them. What I'm doing is I'm literally going through and getting S rank on everything I can, then going back and doing the extra EX mission that unlocks really? for each one when you get to S rank. Yeah. So I, you ha- I don't know if you've done any of these yet, but basically all they want you to do for those extra missions is do the level again, but with a ship that meets certain criteria. Like uh, I had to do- the most ridiculous one that I had to do was complete this mission using a ship that has 
12 or more wing gummies. What? Yeah, it was the dumbest thing I've ever had to build. And I keep having to like, okay, does this one qualify? Nope, I don't have enough. Let me go add some more. So I just had to keep adding wings to the gummy ship. So it <laughs> basically just meant that like I was zipping around the map. And, and what I'm realizing is that these extra missions are pretty much designed to make you as the player understand more components of the gummy missions. Like, uh, uh, like, what uh, what happens when you put enough uh, engines on the ship that you have 50 speed? Oh, wow, you go through the level faster. If you put 12 wings on your ship, you are able to zip around and dodge bullets much easier. Yeah, so I, I've been learning <laughs> about Crazy. this. Like, I used to think that the secret to making a good gummy ship was just loading it down with guns. And sure. I think in a sense that was true in the first game. It's not true in the second game because you actually need to have uh, or you need to invest in the power stat because just throwing more guns on is fine. But the power stat affects what damage is actually dealt by each of those shots. So it's like, OK, so now I have like all these glowing orbs because that's how you increase power. You put shiny balls all over your ship and shiny orbs <laughs> look like something out of Tron. And I, I don't know, like I, I've been having, I've, I have somehow managed to have fun with the ship building aspects of it all. That's so awesome. Um, I'm kind of, I'm really glad to hear because I know in the first game we weren't too keen on the gummies and I feel like they've definitely, I mean, we both talked about it early on where we were like Kingdom Hearts 2, stepped up the gummy missions but no i haven't i haven't dabbled in them like that i'm gonna, I'm gonna have to go back in and really take a look but i want you to screen cap for me a pick like it, your ship with 12 wings on it i have to see what this looks I like i wish i wish i had saved it i mean I, I i could go back and build it again it was the most ridiculous thing i had done but i i don't have it right now because i every uh, time i like i'd had this i just set a different like saved blueprint and i was just like anytime i need to do stupid things with the ship let me just put it in this spot because i probably won't need to do that again <laughs> okay but the next one i need to do is like i think i need to put eight wheels on what? a ship so when i do that i'll put i'll put I'll, I'll take a screenshot of it excellent and i think that is actually it for today unless there's anything else you wanted to get into i i, I don't no, I think that was everything. I, I am excited, so very excited to get into uh, the next world, whichever one it may be. I didn't look at the level requirements, but it's one of them for sure. It's either Agrabah or uh, Nightmare Before Christmas. And I think we'll do them in the correct order this time, too. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think so, as well, as long as I don't screw it up again. <laughs> <laughs> Um, well, awesome. Well, Kyle, uh, this has been fun. And as always, to everybody listening at home, thank you for joining. And we will be talking to you again next week as we jump into this new set of worlds. Absolutely. I'm so looking forward to it. Take care, everybody. And uh, it was good talking to you, Mitch. <laughs> you too. Oh, bye bye. Hey there, Kingdom Hearts fans. Thanks for listening to the episode. Dream Drop Long Distance is hosted by Mitchell Orsino and Kyle Bradshaw and is produced by Kyle Bradshaw. Our theme music was written and recorded by Alex McLean.